This is not the end of the affair. Mark my words, said the blacksmith. But he could not think of anything worse to say and hung his head. Farmer Giles, with his six men and his dozen likely lads and the dragon and all, went on up the hill. And there they stayed quiet for a while. Only the parson was invited to the house. The news soon reached the capital, and forgetting the official mourning and their business as well, people gathered in the streets. There was much shouting and noise. The king was in his great house, biting his nails and tugging his beard. Between grief and rage and financial anxiety, his mood was so grim that no one dared speak to him. But at last, the noise of the town came to his ears. It did not sound like mourning or weeping. What is all this noise about? He demanded. Tell the people to go indoors and mourn decently. It sounds more like a goose fair. <clears throat> the dragon has come back, Lord, they answered. What? said the king. Summon our knights for what is left of them. There is no need, Lord, they answered. With Master Agedeus behind him, the dragon is tame as tame. Or so we are informed. The news has not long come in, and reports are conflicting. Bless our soul, said the king, looking greatly relieved. And to think that we ordered a dirge to be sung for the fellow the day after tomorrow. Cancel it. Is there any sign of our treasure? <laughs> Reports say that there is a veritable mountain of it, Lord, they answered. When will it arrive? They said the king eagerly. A good man, this Agedeus. Send him in to us as soon as he comes. There was some hesitation in replying to this. At last, someone took courage and said, Your pardon, Lord, but we hear that the farmer has turned aside towards his own home but doubtless he will hasten here in suitable raiment at the earliest opportunity. Doubtless, said the king, but confound his raiment. He had no business to go home without reporting. We are much displeased. <laughs> the earliest opportunity presented itself and passed, and so did many later ones. In fact, Farmer Giles had been back for a good week or more and still no word or news of him came to the court. On the 10th day, the king's rage exploded. Send for the fellow, he said, and they sent. It was a day's hard riding to him each way. He, he will not come, Lord, said a trembling messenger two days later. Lightning of heaven, said the king. Command him to come on Tuesday next or he shall be cast into prison for life. Your pardon, Lord, but he still will not come, said a truly miserable messenger returning alone on the Tuesday. 10,000 thunders, said the king. Take this fool to prison instead. Now send some men to fetch the churl in chains, he bellowed to those that stood by. Uh, uh, how many men? They faltered. There's a dragon and and tailbiter and and broomstales and fiddlesticks, said the king. Then he ordered his white horse and summoned his knights, or what was left of them, and a company of men at arms, and he rode off in fiery anger. All the people ran out of their houses in surprise. But Farmer Giles had now become more than the hero of the countryside. He was the darling of the land, and folk did not cheer the knights and men at arms as they went by, though they still took off their hats to the king. As he drew nearer to Ham, the looks grew more solemn. In some villages, the people shut their doors, and not a face could be seen. Then the king changed from hot wrath to cold anger. He had a grim look as he rode up at last to the river beyond which lay Ham and the house of the farmer. 
He had a mind to burn the place down. But there was Farmer Giles on the bridge, sitting on the gray mare with Tailbiter in his hand. No one else was to be seen, except Garn, who was lying in the road. Good morning, Lord, said Giles, as cheerful as day, not waiting to be spoken to. The king eyed him coldly. Your manners are unfit for our presence, said he, but that does not excuse you from coming when sent for. I had not thought of it, Lord, and that's a fact, said Giles. I had matters of my own to mind and had wasted time enough on your errands. Ten thousand thunders, cried the king in a hot rage again. To the devil with you and your insolence. No reward will you get after this, and you will be lucky if you escape hanging. And hanged you shall be, unless you beg our pardon here and now, and give us back our sword. Eh? said Giles. I have got my reward, I reckon. Findings keeping, and keepings having, we say here. And I reckon Tailbiter is better with me than with your folk. But what are all these knights and men for, by any chance? He asked. If you've come on a visit, you'd be welcome with fewer. If you want to take me away, you'll need a lot more. The king choked, and the knights went very red and looked down their noses. Some of the men at arms grinned, since the king's back was turned to them. Give me my sword, shouted the king, finding his voice, but forgetting his plural. <clears throat> Give us your crown, said Giles, a staggering mm -hmm. remark such as had never before been heard in all the days of Middle Kingdom. Lightning of heaven, seize him and bind him, cried the king, justly enraged beyond bearing. What do you hang back for? Seize him and slay him. The men at arms strode forward. Help, 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 cried Garn. Just at that moment, the dragon got up from under the bridge. He had lain there concealed under the far bank, deep in the river. Now he let off a terrible steam, for he had drunk many gallons of water. At once there was a thick fog and only the red eyes of the dragon to be seen in it. Whoa. This is scary looking. All you can see is the eyes. Go home, you fools, he bellowed, or I will tear you to pieces. <gasps> Go home, you fools, or I will tear you to pieces. There are knights lying cold in the mountain pass, and soon there will be more in the river. All the king's horses and all the king's men, he roared. Then he sprang forward and struck a claw into the king's white horse, and it galloped away like the ten thousand thunders that the king mentioned so often. The other horses followed as swiftly. Some had met this dragon before and did not like the memory. The men-at-arms legged it as best they could in every direction save that of Ham. The white horse was only scratched, and he was not allowed to go far. After a while, the king brought him back. He was master of his own horse, at any rate. And no one could say that he was afraid of any man or dragon on the face of the earth. The fog was gone when he got back, but so were all his knights and his men. Now things looked very different with the king all alone to talk to a stout farmer with a tail biter and a dragon as well. But talk did no good. Farmer Giles was obstinate. He would not yield and he would not fight, though the king challenged him to single combat there and then. Nay, Lord, said he, laughing. <laughs> Go home and get cool. 
I don't want to hurt you, but you had best be off or I won't be answerable for the worm. Good day. And that was the end of the Battle of the Bridge of Ham. Never a penny of all the treasure did the king get, nor any word of apology from Farmer Giles, who was beginning to think mighty well of himself. What is more, from that day, the power of the Middle Kingdom came to an end in that neighborhood. For many a mile round about, men took Giles for their lord. Never a man could the king, with all his titles, get to ride against the rebel Agideus, for he had become the darling of the land, and the matter of Saul, and it was impossible to suppress all the lays that celebrated his deeds. The favorite one dealt with the meeting on the bridge in a hundred mock heroic couplets. Chrysophylax remained long in hand, much to the profit of Giles. For the man who has a tame dragon is naturally respected. He was <laughs> housed in the tithe barn with the leave of the parson, and there he was guarded by the twelve likely lads. In this way arose the first of the titles of Giles, Dominus de Domito Serpente, which in the vulgar, Lord of the Tame Worm, or shortly of Tame. As such, he was widely honored, but he still paid a nominal tribute to the king, six ox tails and a pint of bitter, delivered on St. Matthias's day, that being the date of the meeting on the bridge. Before long, however, he advanced the lord to Earl, and the belt of the Earl of Tame was indeed of great length. After some years, he became Prince Julius Agedius, and the tribute ceased. For wow. Giles, being fabulously rich, had built himself a hall of great magnificence and gathered great strength of men-at-arms. Very bright and gay they were, for their gear was the best that money could buy. Each of the twelve likely lads became a captain. Garm had a gold collar, and while he lived, he roamed at his will, a proud and happy dog, insufferable to his fellows for he expected all other dogs to accord him the respect due to the terror and splendor of his master. <laughs> <coughs> the gray mare passed to her day's end in peace and gave no hint of her reflections. In the end, Giles became a king, of course. Wow. The king of the little kingdom. He was crowned in Ham in the name of Agideus Draconarius, but he was more often known as Old Giles Wormy, for the vulgar tongue came into fashion at his court, and none of his speeches were in the book Latin. His wife made a queen of great size and majesty, and she kept a tight hand on the household accounts. There was no getting round Queen Agatha, at least it was a long walk. Thus Giles became at length old and venerable, and had a white beard down to his knees, and a very respectable court, in which merit was often rewarded, and an entirely new order of knighthood. These were the Worm Wardens, and a dragon was their ensign. The twelve likely lads were the senior members. It must be admitted that Giles owed his rise in a large measure to luck, though he showed some wits in the use of it. Both the luck and the wits remained with him to the end of his days, to the great benefit of his friends and his neighbors. He rewarded the parson very handsomely, and even the blacksmith and the miller had their bit, for Giles could afford to be generous. But after he became king, he issued a strong law against unpleasant prophecy and made milling a royal monopoly. The blacksmith changed to the trade of an undertaker, but the miller became an obsequious servant of the crown. The parson became a bishop and set up his see 
in the church of Ham, which was suitably enlarged. Now those who live still in the lands of the Little Kingdom will observe in this history the true explanation of the names that some of its towns and villages bear in our time. For the learned in such matters inform us that Ham, being made the chief town of the new realm, by a natural confusion between the Lord of Ham and the Lord of Tain, became known by the latter name which it retains to this day. For Thane, with an H, is a folly without warrant. Whereas in memory of the dragon, upon whom their fame and fortune were founded, the Draconari built themselves a great house four miles northwest of Tame, upon the spot where Giles and Chrysophylax first made acquaintance. That place became known throughout the kingdom as Ayula Draconaria, or in the vulgar, Worming Hall, after the king's name and his standard. The face of the land has changed since that time, and kingdoms have come and gone. Woods have fallen, and rivers have shifted, and only the hills remain, and they are worn down by the rain and the wind, but still the name endures, though men now call it Wunley, or so I am told. For villages have fallen from their pride. But in the days of which this tale speaks, Worming Hall it was, and a royal seat, and the dragon standard flew above the trees, and all things went well there, and merrily, while Tailbiter was above ground. Envoy. Chrysophylax begged often for his liberty and he proved expensive to feed, since he continued to grow, as dragons will, like trees, as long as there is life in them. So it came to pass, after some years, when Giles felt himself securely established, that he let the poor worm go back home. They parted with many expressions of mutual esteem and a pact of non-aggression upon either side. In his bad heart of hearts, the dragon felt as kindly disposed towards Giles as a dragon can feel towards anyone. After all, there was Tailbiter. His life might easily have been taken, and all his hoard too. As it was, he still had a mort of treasure at home in his cave, as indeed Giles suspected. He flew back to the mountains, slowly and laboriously, for his wings were clumsy with long disuse, and his size and his armor were greatly increased. Arriving home, he at once routed out a young dragon who had had the temerity to take up residence in his cave while Chrysophylax was away. It is said that the noise of the battle was heard throughout Venedotia, when, with great satisfaction, he had devoured his defeated opponent. He felt better and the scars of his humiliation were assuaged, and he slept for a long while. But at last, waking suddenly, he set off in search of that tallest and stupidest of the giants who had started all the trouble one summer's night long before. He gave him a piece of his mind, and the poor fellow was very much crushed. A blunderbuss, was it? said he scratching his head. I thought it was horseflies. Finny, or in the vulgar, the end. <laughs> wow.